The Moton Mailbag is brought to you by the Robert Russo Moton Museum, located in Farmville, Virginia. The Moton Museum is a civil rights museum focusing on the history of Prince Edward County between 1951 and 1964. I'm Kanan Townsend, Director of Education and Public Programs at the Robert Russo Moton Museum, and welcome back to the Moton Mailbag. And I'm Leah Brown, the Assistant Director of Education. The Moton Mailbag is a weekly listener question show. Each week, we'll answer questions about U.S. history, African American culture, civil rights, and more. Feel free to submit your questions via Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moton Museum. Or you can email us at info at moatonmuseum.org. Thank you all for sending in the questions you have been. You all have been great about doing that. And the more you send in, the more we can keep answering these lovely questions. Leah Brown, Mm -hmm. how goes it? It goes. It goes. Keeping it moving. It goes. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're still we're still under lockdown. I mean, I think June tenth is still kind of kind of the the date, but um, you know what? Things still going pretty much the same for you. Yeah, I reorganized my books. Where I am right now. Nice. <laughs> Got a little bookcases. Had to do some shuffling. But yeah. You know, I, st- I started walking and running on the trail. Oh, nice. But like the trail is like packed. You know, well, we're spread out, but like the parking lot, like it's, it's completely full. I was like, well, this isn't exactly social distancing, but you know, physical activity, you gotta get it in where you can. Because the gyms are closed. Yeah. And it's just nice to go for a walk. It's nice outside now. The weather is so nice. <laughs> so like, I want to breathe real air, fresh air. Not recycled air yeah. one million times over inside my walls. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got, <laughs> got some great questions for you all today. Uh, promise it won't be maybe as heavy as last week, but um, we're, we, we can only work with what we're given, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. And I'll ask Leah first. What is your favorite Favorite historical quote or speech? Each one, teach one. I love it. I've always loved that quote. Um, recently, I looked it up because I was like, where is this even from? So apparently, it's an African proverb that was brought over during the time of slavery. So African Americans have em- um, embraced that mentality because depending on the year, eventually laws were put into place that people who were Afri- of African descent or African American, those that were enslaved, could not learn how to read. Because if somebody could read and write, they could easily write a pass and then literally go to freedom that way. So by limiting education opportunities, it limits who could read, who could write, and opportunities for slaves to free themselves um, via paper. Um, So how it worked was if a person somehow learned how to read, learned how to write, they were obligated, expected to teach someone else. So each one teach one to kind of spread that knowledge and information. Like in today's context, it's kind of like if you know something and somebody needs to know it, you tell them. Um, but it's not as, I don't think it's as dire as it was in that time period. Um, it's more of a, this is why I do what I do. Right. Each one teach one. I have a lot of knowledge that I want to share it. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. My quote is... Uh, from Bobby, Robert F. Kennedy. Uh, And it's a quote that's in our permanent exhibit Mm -hmm. here at the museum. And it's my, I don't have a lot of favorite quotes or speeches, just for the record. Um, But Leah's more of a historical person than I am. Um, And I think her answer's probably better. But that's okay. No, that's pretty good. It's pretty good. Mine's not bad. (laughs) Um, So Bobby Kennedy, at the centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1963, he said these words. We may observe with as much sadness and irony that outside of Africa, south of the Sahara, where education is still a difficult challenge, the only places on earth known to not provide a free public education are Communist China, North Vietnam, Sarawak, Singapore, British Honduras, and Prince Edward County, Virginia. Speaking on the schools closing in Prince Edward County, I, I think that that's such a profound quote, and I don't think it could have made much bolder of a statement at much bolder of a time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it really reflected his kind of investment in getting this situation, the Prince Edward County school closings fixed. Um, so I've got, a, I've got that quote on my wall, you know, I've, I've used that in presentations and it's always one of my favorite spots to go in our permanent exhibit. Sounds good. 
sounds good. Um, I think it's always a good teachable moment when we're in the exhibit, and I get to that quote, and I pair it with the protest sign, and the sign says, I've lost four years of education, why five? And in parentheses, it's, let's tell Russia about that. And I love this question, because half the time the kids are like, what? So, Cold War is happening, the U.S. is at war with Russia, and it's all about democracy and freedom and justice as they're going against the communist country. And yet here in Virginia, students are actively protesting and saying, we don't have these rights that you keep talking about and lauding as, you know, America. So work on that, um, I think is powerful. Oh, yeah. I think Great it's juxtaposition. Next question. Yeah, you ready? Yeah, I'm good. What is the most absurd thing you know of that was separated for use by only one race during segregation? So I will share just that I kind of misread this question, which is the reason my answer is what it is, but that's okay, because I'm not going to change it. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> okay, okay, so I'm I, with you, I'm with you. I have two <laughs> answers to this question. Just uh, uh, segregation in general was an absurd kind of construct, but yes. uh, some, to have some examples that I think are particularly absurd is kind of the way I'm going about answering this question. So I think it was, it was so dumb to like and like and like financially like not smart either like to have two doors one white one colored but when you go through the door you're in the same room it's just like why like i get I, like i understand what the thought but like that's just so much extra time energy resources money and you're going into the same room like i can see if there was two separate waiting rooms or something but no like there's just separate halves but you're going through the doorway and you're going to the same room like it's just like why that doesn't make any sense it's the same room. You're breathing the same air. Oh my goodness! My other example is is when you know segregated like lakes, ponds, things like that. Mm -hmm. So, in Prince Edward County, we had the only uh, state park that African Americans could go to in Virginia, um, and that's the Prince Edward. Wait a minute, Prince Edward yeah. County State Park for Negroes. Mm. Um, so we had people all over the state coming to Prince Edward County uh, to come to the to the state park. Now, what it was, was it was Twins, it was, was it called Twins Lake? I don't think it was called Twins Lake mm -hmm. back then, but you had two now. Uh, state parks, and now it's called Twins Lake State Park, but you had the Prince Edward County State Park for Negroes, and you had the other half of the park. Now, or other half of the lake, the thing is, literally separated by a rope, and the, the white, the, the black part of the lake ran, the water ran into the white part of the lake. And so it's like, what are you doing? This doesn't make, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Like, why, like, you're separate because, oh, we don't want to swim in the same water. You're literally swimming in the backwash from the black part of the state park. Why? I just think it's, I just think it's ridiculous. Um, I'm glad that we are, we are post-segregation, but I just, I'm like, well, y'all not thinking? Like, I thought the whole point was to not be together, and y'all are it's literally the, the principle same of being separate. You're right. Yeah. It's the it's stubbornness foolish. to it's the foolish. principle. But I'm just like, Really? <laughs> <laughs> it's the same water. You're in the same room and same air. But, you know, that's me. I didn't live during segregation, so I can't speak on it too much. What about you, Leah? What are your thoughts? Well, seeing as though the country was literally diverse, I mean, Native peoples lived here. Then the English showed up in 1607. And then African Amer Africans were brought, you know, in 1619. This space has always been diverse. So any, like... I get why Jim Crow laws were created. They were created to subjugate people of color. I mean, because once slavery was gone, what was the tool they had to use next? Um, but to me, I guess, like, the wild is, like, all of, well, all of it is the right answer, but I always think about, I guess, a really basic response is a water fountain. Mm -hmm. You know, like those iconic images of somebody trying to drink water and it's water from probably the same source. But the one fountain is disgusting because it's never clean. So it's kind of like a way to reinforce um, second class citizenship for people of color. But it's just weird to think that despite literally living in the same spaces, the same communities, the same places, not all with the same resources, but the same spaces that segregation existed. Um, like, for example, with segregation, people who were living maids 
didn't have can use the same spaces, but li- literally live in, in the same house. It's it's just a weird concept to me altogether. It's all foolish to me. Put it that way. Yeah. Yep, but luckily it doesn't exist, at least in the same form right now. Mm. On to the next one. Mm-hmm. This is it my turn? Yeah. Okay, what books are you reading and or articles? Okay, so I have, two, I have a couple in rotation right now. Rotation. <sighs> so Me as a book. reader, I am not. Yeah. Just the preface again. <laughs> I probably said it a couple weeks ago, but I, yeah. Reading one on the WPA. That was a program during the Great Depression that people were literally paid to go record stories and folk songs. Um, to try, the idea was to create create American culture to showcase it. But regions are so different, states are so different. It kind of some of it was just like a mess, a hodgepodge. Like people, what they expected of a place. They didn't like when it wasn't what they thought it was. For example, Idaho of all places. Um, people who were living there, had lived there, were telling stories in a particular fashion or way. And it was like, well, this can't be right. So that tension right there. Um, yes, I finally got to the part where I talked about Zora Neale Hurston, mm-hmm. one of my faves, mm-hmm. and her um, work in New Orleans. And just her work in general because she was trained... Um, as an anthropologist by Franz Boas, one of the early, like, the first anthropologist so-called within the field. Um, so she had that background. But I thought it was cool how they explained within the book how she could talk to anybody and everybody. And she would change her tone, her her language, her everything to reflect who she was with. So I thought, I thought that was really cool. So that's one thing I'm working on or reading through. The second is... A book on the Outer Banks. Surprise, surprise. Um, and the aspect I'm at right now is about the Civil War, but it's talking about how African Americans, like what they were doing during the conflict, and like from this perspective of the Outer Banks, I've just never read that before, so it's it's all new. So it's really exciting. What you got? Nothing like that. <laughs> um. I, uh, my answer is a little, it's not cheating technically because no. all the articles was in the question too. Mm-hmm. Um, so <laughs> I subscribe to the VPAP and hopefully many of you all have as well, but let me give them a shameless plug, um, vpap.org. Um, but you can sign up and they'll send you emails and it's Virginia news. Um, and they'll send you the, the most kind of important maybe that's not the right word, but like the top news of, of the day. And so every day they'll send me an, an email and I get all of Virginia news that's happening. And so I just kind of skim and pick what articles I want to read, what articles I don't. Um, a lot of it right now is still pretty much COVID-19 focused, but you know, before then it's just like what's happening in the governor's office and what's happening in the legislature, or Virginia Supreme Court or, you know, localities or, or whatever. Um, it's really cool. It's very, very useful. It's free, uh, although I would encourage you to donate as well because that's how they keep going. But it's lovely. I've been a subscriber for how many years now? Five years, four years, something mm-hmm. like that. And it's been, it's been a great, 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 great thing. The pet. All right. Next question? Yeah. So, hypothetically, Leah, let's say you win the lottery. And let's not necessarily quantify, but let's say it's a very large amount of money. Eight figures. <laughs> money. Eight figures or higher. You <laughs> win a lottery. What three organizations, museums, nonprofits, et cetera, et cetera, would you donate to? I feel like I'm going to be real, real honest and say, of course, Moton. But for the purpose of this question, yeah, three we, others. We can rule Moton now because, of course, we're a course. Yeah, like, of course. <laughs> of course, a good portion <laughs> will go to, to the museum. <laughs> How could I not? <laughs> Um, the Maggie Walker National um, Park site, NPS. Love Maggie Walker. I, I do. It, it's a love. Um, to Maggie Walker Governor School. Hey, go Dragons, <laughs> you know. Pretty consistent over the here. Dr- Maggie Walker Dragons? Yeah. All the Governor Schools are Dragons. Really? Yeah. Um, oh, my God. Why? Never mind. Never mind. I'm sorry. Off track. I don't know. I don't know. So, uh, they're cool. Like, they're, I don't know. They're, it's amazing. You, you know, I love dragons. <laughs> so let's not they'll go down that particular rabbit hole. But 
Um, and because I was raised by educators and I, I've seen the struggle and like seeing how so much, so many educators spend their own money to help their students. I would have a fund for teachers. Like, what do you need? Bet. Paid for. You know, because you're investing in teachers, it means investing in students. Right. Some, like, I've traveled all over Virginia, and some teachers are like, we have nothing. Like, I bought this. Yeah. Some, some have, like, everything for re- regional differences. Right. So, to have a pool or a place that any educator from any part of Virginia can go to and know, like, hey, this is what we can rely on, that'd be, I think that'd be awesome. Nice. Yeah. I like the idea a lot. Um, what three words would I give to besides Moten? Uh, I said NPR. Yeah. One, mm. just because I, I love, love me some NPR. I think they are one of the best news organizations around. I think they're very, very fair coverage. Uh, I would give to uh, e- either locally kind of our faces food pantry in, in, in Prince Edward County or to like a food bank system like the Food Bank of Virginia or whatever, you know, I think that's what they're called. Um, just because I think now, you know, with the quarantine stuff has showed us, I mean, even more so how important food banks and food distribution um, it is uh, for people who can't necessarily afford. And I think that's very, very important. Mm-hmm. And then maybe I would, you know, give some some money to Virginia Humanities or like an NEH, you know, somebody who's doing work to preserve the, the work of humanities. Um, I think there's a big STEM focus. Uh, nationwide I think justifiably so to a certain extent I mean I think there's a lot of jobs in, in STEM but I, I, I do think that the humanities are very very important and the work of humanities are very important as well and so making sure to preserve the humanities work in in Virginia and in the country would be very important if I was to become a multi-millionaire all of a sudden mm-hmm. after I nice. paid my taxes <laughs> <laughs> yes pay those taxes yeah no ain't gonna catch me slipping <laughs> All right, lastly, number five. Do you access one or do I access one? I'll ask it. It's fine. You want to rock, paper, scissors for it? No, nah, it's fine. <laughs> um, that probably wouldn't translate well to the podcast. Um, Leah, what do you think about music sampling? I think it's a way to rejuvenate um, older songs, but only because it brings them to the forefront again. You know, not everybody knows or listens to songs from the past. But if you music sample, some people who are motivated will actually find the original. Um, And it's a way to show how music has changed, but yet stayed the same a bit as well. Um, I mean, I like it. It's a way to make connections over generations. Yeah, I'm all for it. I think the more sampling, the better. Um, I think it's the bridge between the the generations. I mean, I think it's really how I got introduced to certain songs or certain genres. I mean, what are you talking about? I mean, Will Smith's whole career pretty much was all music sampling. Um, I I think I didn't hear, you know, Under Pressure by Queen until I heard Vanilla Ice, Ice, Ice Baby, even though he claimed that it wasn't sampled. But uh, I think he court ruled otherwise. But, uh, (laughs) you know. Uh, MC Hammer can't touch this. You know Rick James. We're afraid. You know you name it. Uh, there's a something a, super popular. All the really popular songs I feel like have, are sampled in some way, whether you know it or not. So go and look at those music credits and see. Like, all right, these people mm-hmm. are crediting these people, and if they don't credit them, that's when they end up in trouble in the court. So, um, yeah, I, I'm all I'm all for. It. I think some people don't like it. Like I think that's why we got access yeah, question. Yeah. Um, I think it's. I mean, it, there aren't original idea like bad boys three like 20 years later incredibles two like that was good remaking the lion king like there are no original like ideas like that anymore i mean there are but like nostalgia sells and i think if you can kind of making a a, a sampled song it will appease like the older folks who grew up with the original but also can create a branch to to the new generation who could appreciate like the the auto-tune and the edit edits and the drum machines and all the stuff that wasn't around maybe when the original was out it helps music become a conversation. I think let's talk. I think in 20 years when my kid is old enough to <laughs> understand what's going on and, and they're sampling, you know, Cardi B and, uh, you know, the baby and you know, Katy Perry, Nicki Minaj, whoever, 
They'd be like, Dad, who's this old, you know, what's this, this is a nice beat. I'm like, this ain't new. <laughs> this is like 40 years old. What you know about this? What you, you know? know? <laughs> yeah, what you, what you know? What you know about? What do you know about that? You know, like, and just start a conversation that may not have happened otherwise. Yeah. So. I like it. And Bridges. Yeah, I'm a big fan. Big fan. All right. I guess that wraps it up for this week, right? Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you all for listening. Next week, next Monday, same time, same place. Check your Spotify, your Google Anchor, or Apple Podcast feeds. Uh, please keep sending in the questions. We are loving these questions. They are awesome. Um, any of our social media accounts or email us at info at That'll be it for this week, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.